Now, I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, the big movie was Jurassic Park. It was selling box office records, directed by Steven Spielberg. Everyone thought Jurassic Park was the best movie ever. And the writer, the author of Jurassic Park, Michael Crichton, was a best-selling science fiction writer. And then you'll recall that in 2005, three years before he died, Michael Crichton came out swinging as what people like to call a climate denier. And he wrote a book called State of Fear, about a conspiracy of left-wing scientists uh, to convince people to believe in global warming. He gave speeches before the American Enterprise Institute that were shown on C-SPAN and elsewhere. Why did Michael Crichton dedicate himself to the cause of climate denial? The standard response that you're gonna get uh, from, from those folks, they're gonna say, well, he was paid off. That's a bit of a simplistic answer because he was already a millionaire many, many times over. He was born with a silver spoon in his mouth, so to speak. He was from a very, very wealthy background. If you look at the life of Michael Crichton, you can understand the United States, and you can understand the division in the ruling class right now. But I want to read you a quote from the movie Jurassic Park. Listen, if there's one thing the history of evolution has taught us, it's that life will not be contained. Life breaks free, it expands to new territories, and it crashes through barriers painfully, maybe even dangerously, but, uh, oh, there it is. There it is. Well, in this message of life found a way, what we are finding is an expression of what many people would call the American spirit. And that seems to be why it touched a nerve. And what's amusing about all of this is that these themes also seem to be a very big part of conservatism. Leftist politics around the time of Jimmy Carter became associated with pessimism. Jimmy Carter was a big promoter of the concept of overpopulation. There are too many people in the world. I mean, almost everyone in his administration had come out of something called the Trilateral Commission, which was a think tank set up by the Rockefellers. And the Trilateral Commission was talking about overpopulation and the need to, the need to control the people and the danger of democracy. You know, the Carter presidency was very much a Rockefeller, Eastern establishment, synthetic left presidency. Well, Reagan, you know, his rise as a political figure was about repudiating that and appealing to these sentiments that I'm describing. This go west young man, achieve something, achieve your dreams, work hard, you know, life will not be contained, life breaks free, it expands to new territories, crashes through barriers painfully, even dangerously. This is the divide, really, between the liberals among the bourgeoisie, the ultra-rich, and the majority of the ruling class, the rich, right? Do you aspire to build more and grow more and have more, or do you want to slow things down so that you can stay at the top? The ultra-rich, the Rockefellers, the Carnegies, the DuPonts, they are already at the top, so they want to slow things down. They don't want any competitors. They want to manage things. They want to socially engineer and control so that they can stay and ensure that they stay at the top of the pyramid. Meanwhile, the majority of the ruling class resents that and feels like they're being contained and held back. They don't want to be controlled. This is the divide that has defined American politics for the past hundred years. The fight between the rich and the ultra-rich, the entrepreneurial bourgeoisie, or the managerial bourgeoisie. This is the divide between the pessimistic outlook of the ultra-rich who want to control humanity, fear humanity as a dangerous horde that could potentially get out of control, want to slow down growth and hold everything back so that they can stay at the top of the pyramid, and the optimistic view of the majority of the American bourgeoisie that want to get rich or die trying, get more money, work hard, you know, work relentlessly, get to the top. This is the divide. Michael Crichton very much represented the sentiments of the lower levels of American capital. His whole life tells that story. He was all about working hard, all about getting ahead, uh, all about life finds a way, it overcomes barriers, the relentlessness of the human spirit, the, the idea we're just going to fight to get ahead. The pessimism that dominates a lot of those raising the climate alarm was a big threat to him. Because let's face it, the majority of voices promoting climate change have a pessimistic worldview. 
They say human beings have gone too far, we're using too many resources, we're reproducing. Growth is bad. Economic growth is bad. We need to stop growing. We need to stop moving ahead as a species. We need to slow down. It is a pessimistic worldview. There's actually a book published by the Club of Rome, The Limits to Growth. Right? You know, some of these documentaries that have come out recently about climate change actually attack the concept of growth. They go as far as saying growth is bad. We've got to go backward. That is the worldview of the ultra rich. And it is their think tanks and their foundations and their institutions and their intelligence agencies that have come to dominate what is called left wing politics. That is inherently opposite of Marxism. Marxism says there is no limit to growth. Marxism says that with the banks, factories and industries organized rationally and no longer controlled for profit, there is no limit to human creativity and growth. That we can continue to grow and grow and grow. That's what Marxism says. Marxism says that not only can we have it better than we have it today, but with rational control of the means of production, by eliminating the anarchy, the anarchy of profits in command, that humanity can grow and grow and grow, and that so much abundance can be created, so much prosperity can be created, so much peace can be created, so much comfort can exist, that eventually the need for any coercion at all can go away. The state as an institution will wither away. That is the vision of Marxism is that with rational planning of the economy, without the greed of the capitalist in command, without the capitalist exploiting the worker, but with all of society owning and controlling the wealth together, with the major centers of economic power, the banks, the big factories, the big box stores, the airlines, the means of communication, the means of transportation, with the major centers of economic power, the oil wells and the coal mines, with all these things being consciously, rationally planned and owned by all, all of society and organized to work in the interests of all of society, growth will be unlimited and that humanity can get to astounding heights and that all of us can be far, far wealthier and far, far more comfortable than the richest billionaire in our time. Marxism is an optimistic ideology. It is an ideology that says Human creativity and human brilliance is unrestrained. Read Frederick Engels and his writings about the role of labor in the transition from ape to man. The human beings have gone from hunter-gatherers in caves to Mesopotamia and Greece and Rome to medieval Europe to the Industrial Revolution and all the way up to space travel and iPhones and YouTube Human beings are creative creatures that are capable of achieving real, astounding miracles. And human beings are creatures that long to grow and expand. The nature of humanity is growth. Check out Anna Louise Strong, amazing, amazing American journalist from Seattle. She said the American mentality, what she calls the motor mindedness of the American spirit, that pioneer, go work hard and build things spirit that Anna Louise Strong identified with America. She says that during the Great Depression, that American spirit had been lost. They felt that the state didn't care about them. They felt that the government didn't care about them, that they were on their own. They were hopeless and frustrated during the 1930s. But it was the Soviet Union that was the new America. The Soviet Union was where that optimism was found where people believed that tomorrow could be better than today. And the smartest engineers and scientists and writers were all going to the Soviet Union and marveling about it. And that the Soviet Union, with its five-year economic plans, with its big construction projects, with its campaigns to wipe out illiteracy, building new schools and hospitals all over the country, what Stalin was doing in the Soviet Union, the economic achievements of the 1930s, where one of the poorest countries in the world, Russia at the time, one of the poorest countries in the world became a superpower and industrialized itself with the biggest hydroelectrical power plants in the world. The best music was coming out from Shostakovich, 
the best ballet performers in the world, the best films with Sergei Eisenstein, everything that the Soviet Union was achieving in the 1930s. People in the 1930s, they said that the Soviet Union is the new America. Where, where is the go get them, go out and achieve your dreams mentality found today in China? Absolutely. China is building high speed railway all across the planet. It's raising impoverished countries around the world up, building electricity there, power plants. China very much has that same idea. You could say now that China is the new America because it's China that is talking about the Chinese dream, is talking about the mass line, you know, socialism with Chinese characteristics, one belt, one road initiative, the shared community and vision of all mankind, all of this stuff, all of the stuff that people used to associate with America, that work hard vision, that belief that we're going to build a better country, tomorrow is going to be better than today, people now associate it with China. The right wing in the United States has wrapped up their optimism with ruthless, rugged individualism, with chauvinism, national chauvinism, bigotry, anti-communism, climate denial. Their optimism is simply an expression of the will of the lower levels of capital to make profits and a hostility toward anything that might get in the way of the ultra rich and their desire to make profits. To be conservative in the United States in our time means that you are a worshiper of capitalism. That's all it means. Meanwhile, there's the American left wing. And as Marxism has faded away, the so-called left wing of American politics has been infected with pessimism, this dark view and this contempt for humankind. Populism is the greatest evil, according to the American liberal, because populism means that the rabble are getting together the inferior, uneducated masses are coming together and organizing for their rights and demanding things and protesting. They're not smart enough to do that. No, we need smart intellectuals to manage them and control them, give them phones to dazzle them all the time, give them drugs to take and control their minds. Just let the broad masses of people, this vulgar mob that threatens the intellectual, let them be carefully controlled. Let them gradually die off. Manage them, control them, educate them so that they're not racist, sexist, homophobic, and uneducated. That is the liberal view. So what do you do as an American Marxist? What do you do? The answer is you get to the masses. You get to the masses with two things. The first thing, which is American rebirth. And if you're gonna get ahead as a country, we need to be reborn. I've said many times before, and I will say it again, that if something is conceived in an impure way, it is corrupted. If the way something is established is impure, the product is impure. In legal terms, they talk about fruit of a poison tree. Capitalism from its inception has been a genocidal system. The United States was established in the process of primitive accumulation, the process of capitalists, capitalists seizing, seizing control of the world for themselves and crushing all kinds of lives. If the United States is going to get better, it's going to require a political, economic, and spiritual refoundation. And this is my concept of the American rebirth that the USA must be reconceived in a spirit of brotherhood and kindness and compassion and shared destiny. The other thing that needs to be made clear is that if you really want that human spirit of growth to return, if you really want that optimism that keeps people going to return, if you want that motor mindedness, that American mentality, that work hard and get ahead, that achieve your dreams, that entrepreneurial mentality, if you want to get that, socialism is the way. It's socialism that turned both Russia and China into superpowers. It's socialism that made Cuba, a small island in the Caribbean, known all over the world for its healthcare system. It's socialism that raised millions from poverty and continues to do so around the world. And that socialism 
Socialism, if it's going to be successful, it's going to capture the imagination of the American people. Socialism is not about crushing people's creativity. Socialism is about unleashing people's creativity and lifting it, lifting it from the restraints of the profit system. Socialism is about allowing human brilliance to go further than ever before. Socialism is about getting beyond the chaos of the market, the system where people are homeless because there are too many houses, where people are hungry because there's too much food. Socialism is about allowing us to come together as a species and rebuild not just one country, but the whole planet in a rational way. But socialism is also not pessimistic. It's not dark. Socialism is the human species asserting itself and asserting that no, we're not going to go extinct. No, we're not going to stop growing. Socialism is an ideology that understands that life will not be contained. Life breaks free, expands to new territories, crashes through barriers painfully, and maybe even dangerously.